Good morning, everyone, or afternoon, everyone. Again, my name is Patrick Solar. I'm from Alton Engineering Services. Thank you for joining us for the. Uh, sorry. Ideation and Innovation um, Forum today. Uh, we're going to have a panel discussion about um, implementing autonomy. And um, I will start sharing my screen and um, introduce our panelists for today. Uh, I would like to thank uh, Yvonne Ver Vermillion, the uh, president of the Wright, Dayton Wright AFSIA panel for um, organizing this for us. And um, our panelists today come from uh, uh, industry and government and academia uh, to discuss implementing autonomy, um, not only in the Air Force, but uh, some of the challenges that are um, facing um, the industry as well as uh, statewide initiatives. Um, and um, as soon as I get the presentation loaded, we'll get started. So panelists today uh, from the University of Illinois Champaign is Sion Mitra uh, from the United States Air Force, Christopher Garrett, and from Drive Ohio is Nick Hegemeyer. So uh, Nick Hegemeyer is from Drive Ohio and Nick, would you like to introduce yourself? Sure. Um, so my name is Nick Hagemeyer, like, like Pat said, Managing Director of Infrastructure for Drive Ohio. So I handle everything from connected and automated vehicle aspects, as well as the infrastructure to support them, both on the, um, on the vehicle and on the roadside. Thank you, Nick. Um, our next panelist uh, is joining us in a few minutes, but it's Christopher Garrett. He's a senior level executive technical advisor for systems engineering for the Air Force Lifecycle Management Center there at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Um, he's the lead engineer developing the Air Force Material Command Strategy for digital transformation. And um, he's also focusing on uh, ensuring that the Material Command digital campaign is appropriately replicates and expedites the system engineering process. Now, our third panelist is uh, Cyan Mitra from the University of Illinois. Cyan, would you like to introduce yourself? Uh, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to participate in this panel. Uh, my name is Cheyenne Mitra. I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at uh, the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. I'm also a professor of computer science. Uh, my research is in the broad area of uh, safe autonomy. Uh, my research group develops uh, algorithms and tools for verification testing of uh, autonomous systems like uh, self-driving cars, drones. Uh, I also teach several courses on related topics at the university, and I serve as the associate De director of the newly formed uh, Center for Autonomy. Great. And Cheyenne is going to kind of get us started on um, talking about uh, this topic, and uh, I'll let him begin from here. Great. Yeah, so um, I wanted to uh, position this problem or topic of discussing implementing autonomy with the broader trends on what has been going on for more than a decade now. Uh, so I think all of you would agree that we are going through a period of rapid technological innovation and change. Some people call this the fourth industrial revolution. Uh, and it doesn't matter how you 
slice it. Uh, it is clear that software is the agent for technological disruption. Um, and look at the 10 biggest companies. 10 years ago, these were companies that moved matter. Uh, now the biggest companies move bits. Earlier, it was about extracting raw materials and bending metals, manufacturing. Uh, those are very important parts of the economy, but increasingly we see that uh, in a matter of just 10, 15 years, uh, the major activity in the biggest companies are about coding, developing code. Another way of looking at it is just the amount of code that goes into the different devices and our day-to-day -day appliances. Um, so I pulled this statistic from the internet uh, and many here would be uh, have deeper expertise on this topic, but a fighter aircraft uh, like the F-22 had like 5 million lines of code a few decades ago, and now even a regular uh, car will have 100 million lines of code. And code is not just enabling things to be more portable, uh, easier to develop, but they're also contributing to the large part of the economy. So this lowest chart here um, makes this point that, uh, you know, actually just 100 billion lines of code or 150 billion lines of code, which is not a whole lot, contributes a very large fraction to the US economy. So, uh, and this is happening at every scale, not just the national or the global level, but uh, at a state level and institution level. So one way to uh, frame our questions or the discussion today is to see how, as we move from this open loop systems or the IT systems where most of these disruptions have been happening towards systems like safety critical systems and autonomous systems, uh, how to manage, control, and leverage uh, the software uh, disruptions. Okay. Uh, so there are many examples that we can keep in mind, like infrastructure, transportation, freight, and logistics, where these effects are going to uh, happen or already starting to happen. So my expertise is in this area of uh, software verification and testing. So I wanted to give you a bird's eye view of this life cycle of how software is developed and tested. So everything starts with uh, design or programming. Increasingly, uh, this is uh, also uh, machine learning and data is playing a big role in this. Uh, by the way, can I use the pointer on the slides as I speak? Is there a mechanism for doing that? Not clear. You can't see my pointer, right? No. I don't think so. You, yeah, Yvonne is the... Um administrator so okay that's fine right so uh, it starts with the coding and the design and then um, when we go into the testing and verification phase there are two important inputs so first we have the actual system that is being tested uh, could be a piece of code or a model could be even some hardware components and then the second piece are the requirements, the properties that we want to check. You can think of these requirements coming from standards like the ISO 26262 standard, which is often used for vehicles. You can move on to the next part. And then the output of this uh, testing verification phase can be one of two things. Either we get a counter example or a bug showing that the requirement is violated. Now this is useful because then, uh, moving forward please, then uh, this bug can be used to uh, refine the system or the code. And this cycle that is drawn here, uh, testing and debugging, this is a large part of software development. You may have heard that 80% you know, of software development is really debugging. Uh, and uh, the rest is coding and build and all of that. Then after we have spent a bunch of time in this debugging cycle, the hope is that we can get to this final box here, which is the holy grail, where we have a proof that all the behaviors of the system meet 
the requirement that we want. Okay. And this can serve as a certificate that can be then used by federal agencies as a proof that the product is safe and meets the requirements. There's a lot of been there's been a lot of academic research on coming up with this testing verification work. Uh, amazing progress has been made in the last uh, decade or two decades to make this process uh, much more automatic, efficient, uh, and uh, usable. But there are big challenges ahead as we take these academic ideas, uh, research ideas to implement autonomy at scale. And then in the next slide, I basically try to give a picture of what is happening in the software industry, not autonomous systems, which gives us a nice indication for where autonomy research and autonomy uh, implementation has to go, following the lead of the Googles and the Facebooks, the software giants, basically. All right, so here are some numbers. I learned from these papers that are cited on this slide that Google runs 150 million automated tests every day. Okay, And the way it works is every time a developer commits some code, some change in their repository, this automatically triggers in the back end the integration of that code, the building of that code, and then deploying the tests on a compute farm. All of this happens automatically. The results come back, and then the developers get to see what happened, which tests fail, what debugging needs to happen. Okay, so keep that number in mind. Facebook runs this enormous website, which has many components running on many different servers, and they change their configurations at least three times every day. And they're able to manage these configuration changes live on the fly. So imagine running a fleet of autonomous delivery drones serving a large part of the state or the city, and which is constantly getting uh, updated, reconfigured, and the service does not get disrupted from the user's point of view. That's a much more complicated system than Facebook's in some sense, because we have uh, interaction with the environment, humans, and all of that involved, but the same type of technology will be needed to manage these configuration changes. And finally, in the last bullet, uh, here is another number. The tests that are running on this infer engine at Facebook takes about 15 minutes. Okay, That's a pretty short amount of time, right? So a developer develops some code, commits it, runs the tests or automatically gets the test results in 15 minutes for a pretty complicated system. That's an amazingly small number compared to where we are at in the design automation for autonomous systems. Typically, tests will run overnight and you'd have to come back the next day to uh, get the results. So the takeaway I want you to have from this part is if you can kindly go back to the previous slide, uh, we would want that whole pipeline, starting from the code to the requirements to the certification or the bug for autonomous systems like self-driving cars and drones to work in the order of 15 minutes automatically all the time. So that if there is a security vulnerability or a major bug or a major adaptation to a natural disaster that needs to happen, all of this can be happening very quickly in a matter of minutes, and the administrators of the system can cope with it. Okay. Uh, so that, that's sort of what I wanted to leave you with, and we can come back and discuss some of these later. Thank you. Very, very good. Thank you, Cheyenne, for, for sharing that. I think um, now as we move into um, a state person, perspective and industry, um, we have Nick Hegemeyer to share with us some of the challenges and the complexity in um, implementing autonomy, not only on the, on our roadways, but also in the air. So Nick, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Pat. 
So drive Ohio, fly Ohio. Um, if you want to go back a slide, I can talk a little bit. Um, we're, we're really on the ground and in the air, automated and connected. And we've just introduced electric infrastructure into our mix. And when we talk about electric in infrastructure, I think of both ground vehicle charging and air vehicle charging at some of these hub locations, wherever they may be, to support the, the citizens and, and the mobility of, of those citizens. And next slide. So here you can see a lot of our ecosystems that we have within the state. All of our partners, you know, the Air Force Research Labs is there, and we'll talk about some of the partnerships that we have with them on, on the next slide. But I just want to give everybody a, an idea of what's happening in the Ohio mobility ecosystem. And we're trying to increase projects, you know, almost on a weekly, if not daily basis, just to try to stay within the mix and keep trying to lead in some of these areas where um, auto automation will provide great benefits to, to the nation. And the next slide. <clears throat> so I mentioned the Air Force Research Labs and our Fly Ohio initiative partnered with our with a sky vision system right around the Springfield Beckley Airport, the 200 square mile area, lower altitude airspace that really allows the, the development and testing of beyond line of sight aerial applications and operations. So as people come there to test, as the industry comes there to test and develop their, their systems, we can then send them, and as those, as those um, tests are proven, we can then send them to other areas of the state where the, they may focus more on, on their operation and focus on their specific needs. <clears throat> Next slide. And, and one of those areas would be the US-33 Smart Mobility Corridor. Um, we, call it, we, we say it's the world's largest integrated smart mobility test corridor um, on the ground and in the air. On the air side, we have a unmanned traffic management research project currently currently going. Um, that project is really testing and, and trying to manage the lower altitude air, airspace to deconflict flight operations, both on the unmanned and the, and the manned side. So that you know everybody, we can we can move people and goods from place to place, and per, still perform some of those detection-based operations um, that are that are needed to support the ground infrastructure network. And on the ground side, if you look up at the top right of this of this slide, you'll see that red corridor, and that's the 35-mile length corridor where all this testing is underway. We are we have implemented. <clears throat> 63 roadside units along that 35 mile stretch for for communication with connected vehicles and both on the on the ground and in the air um, and those are all connected via a 35 mile stretch that that complete stretch of roadway is covered with fiber or, or is connected with fiber and it's a redundant path so if the fiber on the 33 main line gets cut, we do have a, a redundant pathway using local county routes to, to maintain the, the lines of communication. Um, you can see some of some of the applications from the corridor, um, both, both, transmitting, both transmitting information about what the, what the air traffic is seeing from the ground perspective using those detection-based drones. Um, and transmitting that information to the ground network so that that information can be disseminated to the motoring public on the ground. And then we're also deploying um, four to six applications for the specific to the ground transportation. Those applications are um, reduced speed lane closure warning, which really focuses around work zones and the lane closures and, and reduced speed limits that sometimes encompass work zones. Um, there's curve speed warning. So focusing on those loop ramps, those exits, exits and entrance ramps to um, let the drivers know that they may be traveling too fast for the conditions of that ramp. And then within the cities of Marysville and Dublin, you see on the, in the middle and on the southeast 
end of that corridor, we're focusing on pedestrian warnings and um, red light violation warnings. So notifying the motorists that they, they have the probability or there's a high probability of them encountering a, motor, a, a pedestrian along their trajectory. And then also measuring the speed at which they're approaching an intersection in combination with the intersection, you know, signal timing and, phase, and phasing, signal phasing and timing, giving them an alert that the probability for them to run the red light is, is high. Um, additionally, we have two, two or three additional applications on that corridor, one for both um, wrong way entry, the wrong way driver alert, so signifying to the, the surrounding motorists that there may be a wrong way driver in their area, and then cue warnings um, signifying that there's a stop, you stop traffic ahead of you. And then we have various um, spot weather warnings as well for high wind visibility, and um, road conditions such as ice on the road or, or wet pavement. So this corridor is um, our main flagship corridor for the state. Supporting, you know, like I said, both on the ground and in the air. And we're looking forward to increasing the testing on this corridor over time. And we'll go to the next slide. And all of these projects wouldn't be possible for interoperability without some system engineering. Um, we started this project back in 2018 and we're wrapping it up this month and we will be integrating it into the rest of the statewide architectures later this year. But the main purpose of this is to create some base level system requirements for all of the deployments to follow, give them valid verification and validation plans, and then um, provide them guidance on development of, of concept of operations for, for their own deployments. Um, a lot of effort goes into some of these system engineering on a, on a project specific basis. And what we tried to do with, with this statewide implementation is reduce the, the cost and the time frame needed to get to get to the, the deployments underway, get actual activity on this on the roadway network underway by taking some of the, the larger lift out of, out of some of those projects and making it more of a statewide standard. <clears throat> and so one may ask, well, why are we doing all of these projects? And we go to the next slide. It's all about data. And how can we utilize the data from all of these different devices, both third-party data, data that we're receiving on our own infrastructure, and then even data from you know mobile apps and things of, things of that nature, and how can we develop insights based off of that data to increase efficiencies and safety throughout the transportation network and in the Ohio Department of Transportation operations as well. So we've um, started the development and we're nearing a the completion of a production level environment for the event streaming platform or ESP as we call it for short. And some of the some of the research that's currently underway is taking a look at the operations of um, of ODOT, the operations division, and seeing if we can't create efficiencies in, in those in those offices, in those divisions, to streamline some of the more challenging or even some of the more monotonous tasks that are done every day. And then taking those taking those lessons learned there and, and the data as well to streamline efficiencies and make our roads safer so we can reduce the number of fatalities and the number of accidents that occur on our roadways every year. Um, one, one example that I always like to give is if we can, if we can cap capture all of the data that may be involved leading up to a, an accident occurring, and then, then based on the severity of severity of that accident, even make even further develop even further insights into why that accident occurred and what led up to that accident occurring. Then, historically, we can use that data and develop the prob develop applications that would determine or provide the the probability 
of an accident occurring at any, any given time. And once we get that probability, then we really become a proactive based operations versus a reactive. You know, we're not always having to just send the SWAT or send the freeway service patrol. We can now take take measures to reduce that probability and, and eliminate the accident or reduce the possibility of that accident occurring. Um, if you want to go to the next slide, and I think that's my last. Um, we would be remiss if we didn't, you know, always consider the workforce in Ohio. And as we're developing these technologies, making sure that we involve our educational partners within the state. Um, we always like to say, come here to test, but stay here to grow because it was in Ohio. And we really mean that we want to develop the workforce here in Ohio so that, you know, as companies come here to test, they see the workforce availability and that that leads them to, to stay here and, and utilize our workforce as it, as it comes out of the technicals, colleges, universities, you name it. So a couple of these programs that we've already started is the OBU, OBU workforce training program, really developing the curriculum for um, installing and equipping vehicles with onboard unit technology for the connected vehicle environment. And then we've also started an, a partnership with AAA to really upskill some of the auto tech industry on on how to maintain and 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 treat, I guess is what way I would call it, and operate some of these automated driving assistance systems. And I'll turn it back over to you, Pat. Well, thank you, Nick. Um, I just have a couple questions for you. Why was Ohio selected? Um, because this slide says we're the world's largest integrated smart mobility test corridor. How did we get such world recognition? Well, I think it started with a vision. Um, making sure that you have the foundational infrastructure to support multiple different technologies. And that's one of the things that the that the ATC MTD grant allowed us to do. Um, by having the fiber and all of the roadside units along the, along the roadway, along the corridor, it really allows us to test and develop any of those technologies that may come our way. Um, the 33 corridor has also interesting weather and um, weather patterns as you know, you, you travel north, northwest along the corridor. It seems to get colder and, and conditions seem to get worse as you pass Marysville. And then the unique roadway geometric designs also allow, you know, multiple different testing for multiple different roadway designs. And I think um, you really get that world's largest, maybe even the world's most connected. You really get that from our interactions with industry and what they're what their vision or what they're seeing related to the corridor activities. Gotcha. So along this corridor, you're testing connected and autonomous vehicles as well as uh, unmanned aerial aircraft? Correct. Okay. And then um, as far as some of the software uh, coding and verification, um, Cheyenne, like, can you maybe share, like, maybe the complexity or the magnitude of how much data a car would be creating or an aerial vehicle might be creating and, and how difficult it would be to verify and, and make sure that that software code would be, you know, um, meet the results that are necessary from a safety standpoint? Oh, you might be on me. Sorry. Yeah, that's a great question. I can take a crack at it. So uh, there are two separate parts of it. One is the data. Of course, these cars and drones, uh, they're sensor rich. They have cameras, multiple cameras in some cases, LIDAR, GPS, uh, many other sensors. And these sensors produce a, a tremendous volume of data. I've heard numbers like uh, several gigabits to even terabits per second. Uh, uh, per that, okay. per, sorry, ter terabits would be per minute, uh, gigabits per second for sure. Wow. 
okay. for uh, multiple uh, high resolution cameras and lidars that would uh, need to be recorded if uh, if uh, you want to record everything but um, there is also work now that shows that you don't necessarily want to record every camera frame every second but uh, you know you want to sample and there are technologies for doing it uh, uh, sort of in a smarter way uh, so that you can still reconstruct what is going on uh, uh, without having to record everything so that's just the data side of things like recording for the purposes of uh, replay debugging uh, then there is a second part of your question which is on testing and verification and that's uh, not just about data anymore that also involves code and how to analyze the code and this is a particularly hard version of this verification problem uh, in uh, what we just saw is it's a distributed system right so there are multiple agents interacting with each other uh, so there, there is concurrency involved. You can't just sequentially check the actions of a single agent. You have to worry about their interactions, uh, which, uh, which is a well-known hard problem. Again, there has been a lot of uh, progress in that area, techniques for doing abstractions so that you don't have to necessarily worry about all possible interactions of multiple agents. Um, but I think uh, from what I saw in... Uh, Nicholas's previous presentation, it seems like it's set up in a very nice way, right? So they've identified the different interfaces. They're going about it in a very systematic way with requirements and uh, uh, standard implementations so that at least uh, the researchers or the uh, folks coming around with verification and testing technologies would have a well-defined problem in their hands to look at and then apply their techniques to. Excellent. Excellent. And I think that's a good transition for what uh, Chris is facing uh, with the um, Air Force's digital campaign. And uh, I think um, we could have Chris talk about that digital campaign and the digital ecosystem. Chris, would you like yeah, to hi, Pat. Be there? Yeah. You can hear me? Yep. Go ahead. Hey, fantastic. Hey, um, Great to be with everyone. Uh, I don't probably no one but you, Pat, maybe knows that I'm a little bit late, and I'm really excited because I uh, just got to spend uh, about an hour with um, General Bunch, our four-star material command, and all of his senior leaders uh, across the centers and across the whole command, um, talking really about what I'm going to talk to you about today. Um, and so I can tell you that General. Bunch is completely, uh, thoroughly, 100 percent, uh, many ad adverbs as I can use uh, behind what I'm presenting to you today. Uh, he wanted me to make that known, and uh, he said that last week also at the at the AFA, if you caught any of that. So I uh, appreciate you starting this off. I, I, you know, part of the good news, and I, and I, I only caught, uh, I caught all the last, uh, the second brief here, Nick, and also uh, uh, most, some of the the first one, and what I've seen is that uh, the good news is is that we're all consistent. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about uh, might might be a slightly different facet, but at the core, it's very consistent with what you've already heard. And so one that makes me feel good uh, uh, because it, it shows me that even though we're in you know diverse fields, and um, the principles are the same, and and and, and that's what I'm I'm going to show you from my view of the world which is what the Air Force is trying to do is has already been touched on somewhat is, you know, move to a cloud to enable us to get the efficiencies um, and the effectiveness of, uh, of collaboration. Right. And, and actually even costs. I, I, I can't tell you. I won't even start to, be, to tell you about the many uh, client server applications of the, of the, of the very same kind uh, that we have across the Air Force um, into the, the, the many scores uh, which is very inefficient for the Air Force and causes lots of maintenance problems uh, besides just the licensing, uh, access, security, and, and inconsistencies, by the way, uh, across the many different Air Force bases who run, for example, their IT infrastructure differently. And so in many cases, there's not consistency, there's not rep reciprocity, and it creates just a massive amount of problems. So going to the cloud is, is absolutely going to be a, a, a good thing for a lot of reasons. 
um, for the Air Force and for all of us. And so as I'm showing in this bottom black, as I'm calling the foundational elements for the Air Force, it's not all the elements. And so this briefing, this 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 uh, picture that eventually we're going to get to called the digital ecosystem for the Air Force is, is the top level concepts. And then there's lots of details that need to be worked out. And that would take us uh, many, many, many days and weeks to go through. And that's what I do uh, and have been doing intently for the past year. And so as you can see there, I list four, four major elements, uh, product lifecycle management, which is really about the data management that someone, has, and Nick, I think already, already mentioned, Fences, which is our multi-security uh, mechanism to go from unclassified all the way to special access. Cloud One, which is our um, cloud application system, and then Platform One, which, which right now is our DevSecOps agile software development mechanism. And so that's our foundation of, of what I'm going to talk to you about in this digital ecosystem. And on top of that, yes, on top of that are, are, are five more elements. And in particular, the five elements, um, that the three, the three of those five that I want to talk to, and I wanted to um, bring this up on mine so I can um, see it better. The, um, there we go. The three that uh, I want to talk to are the standards, the tools, and the data. So you see you have data management at the bottom, so you need a mechanism, whatever that is, right? You have to come up with a mechanism uh, to manage your data across the enterprise so that you have, like we call in the, in the Air Force, I'm not sure how widespread the term authoritative source of truth is, but that's what we call it. So it's consistent data, right? And I think that was that was mentioned. <laughs> Everybody needs to be operating off the same sheet of music, the same data, and I'm not even going to start to tell you how bad that is uh, in the Air Force, uh, and I don't know about other companies. And so um, the bottom layer allows you, right, to use the data, the tools, and the standards, and the models in a, in a consistent manner uh, across the enterprise. And of course, you need uh, the training and the tools to be in place uh, to do that. So as we move up the, the left side of the chart, what, what I'm showing you in our strategy, embraced by Air Force leadership, uh, all the way up to uh, the Pentagon staff AQ, right, is in the Air Force, uh, the idea of trade space analysis. So, so what we do, and I think most companies and organizations, right, when you have an idea, when you have a concept, uh, technology exploration, and for us in the Air Force, uh, for sure that uh, we're affected by threats across the world. We're uh, uh, certainly affected by technology, uh, by uh, obsolescence, all kinds of things, right, uh, uh, affect uh, what you need to do uh, a trade space exploration on to try to get to some optimization. Right, that's what you want. You have a problem, you're going to attack it. You're going to do a bunch of modeling simulation and try to figure out based upon what you have at hand, your con ops, your current inventories, your tools, um, and so forth and so on. Right across the board, you're going to be mod simming. At least that's what we do, and I assume most businesses, whatever you are, you know, do that to explore the trade space of of where do we invest, and that's what it's all about. Right, where do we invest? Where do we get the biggest bang? for our buck, and, and we do that extensively in the Air Force uh, across uh, the board, right, the many domains. What's not happening and has been a, a challenge for, for the Air Force is connecting, tightly connecting the results of what we do in our trade space exploration with the rest of the process, I'll call the process. And so if you go ahead and, and build, Pat, what, 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 we're tr what we want to do is use uh, what we call MBSC, model-based system engineering, to uh, connect everything together with an accompanying data architecture. So in the future, one of the, what we are going to do, right, in, as a part of our mod sim analysis is we're going to produce an arc, what I call an architectural model, which uh, at the basic core, right, is a system, a system modeling language, a SysML model, which is going to show the functional relationships and capability, uh, uh, the decomposition, the actors, the behaviors, the dynamics, all of that as a part of the capability, again, whatever it is, whatever field you're in that you're trying to produce. And so uh, this is obviously not a lesson on SysML or MBSE, but I do want to let you know that that is the key mechanism that the Air Force is looking to, to connect these blue arrows that you see at the top. And so you can see a snapshot of an actual MBSE system model in that second column. And, and, and so what, as I said, the results of the first phase of your exploration, we want uh, to we want that group. And there's several groups that do that. And you can see them if you can blow that chart up. Right. Who produce analysis uh, to provide a model to the people who now go and procure the capability. 
whatever's come out of your trade space. And that is uh, what we call program offices in the Air Force. And so we want them to get a model and we want that model uh, to be based on a reference. And so we are pursuing this across the board. I don't have time to, to go in this today. I, I do have charts uh, which describe the, the reference architectures that we are building uh, in the Air Force across many domains, weapons, nuclear, command and control, avionics, uh, and you can break down avionics into radar and communications and radios and data links and so forth and so on. So that's what we're doing, right? We are building these reference models, which uh, when provided to a contractor will guide, constrain, help, um, and show uh, the basis to the contractor for the interfaces that the Air Force wants to control. We want to control certain features of future systems so we have the agility and the ability, right, to inject new technology, new capabilities as needed without being stuck, right? We want to have those open architectures, the standards that I mentioned earlier, built into our reference architectures so that I can go and what I like to call it, get innovation everywhere. Uh, there's all kinds of small companies, you know, two person, one person, three person, 50 person whatever, who have great ideas. And in the big world of DOD and the Air Force, it's hard a lot of times for small companies to get into the game. Uh, and besides that, a lot of small companies will work uh, SIBRs, you know, small business investment uh, projects, and growing those projects can be really hard, again, because you have to get the result of that project into a larger weapon system so you can get mass production. And that's very, very hard. And this, this uh, approach allows that because what we intend to do on future SIBRs at some point, I'm, I'm not sure what that point is, is right, we're going to again provide reference architectures to the SIBR winners so that they can now build on the same architectural reference that we are using in our major weapon systems. And so whatever cool technology or cool algorithms or whatever that they're able to work on, uh, we can efficiently uh, get that into our major weapon systems. And so in the future, as you see in the third column that you uh, you put up there, Pat, um, we have the infinite loop, which is a symbol right for continuity and being continuous. So we don't want to, in the Air Force, uh, work up over a year or two or three to big design reviews and find problems there. We want from day one when we go on contract and we establish the basis through the data architecture, the reference architecture, the modeling architecture, um, and the means by which we're going to pass that information back and forth with the contractor to have continuous review. And I mean, it's 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 like you know the agile people uh, have really conquered the world with their CI/CD approach, and that's really what we're doing, right? We're going to establish the means by which we can do continuous integration, development, and review. Uh, for the Air Force. And then finally, as we, as we go through and we finally produce the weapon system, whatever it is, uh, we're going to stay connected with the sustainment people who have uh, their own need, right, for uh, logistical data and uh, logistical uh, drawings, uh, which is part of data. Uh, they're, the, you know, their processes themselves that they want to improve uh, with the machining and the, and the manufacturing that they do. And so we will, we will stay connected through these uh, references that I mentioned uh, throughout from beginning to end. All right, that was a uh, blitz, you know, through this. We're, we're, we're orchestrating all this through lines of effort. Uh, I don't know if those were mentioned, but we have uh, uh, six of them, as you can see. And, and as you would imagine, given the ecosystem that I just described to you, it's extensive. And as General Bunch just said from the meeting that I came with, it, Chris, it's everything. And he wanted, of course, everyone to know that. And he's, and he's emphasizing. And of course, I said, yes, sir, I understand. It is the entire command, really the, the entire Air Force that's moving to this new digital world. So those are the POCs. You can see them from line of effort uh, zero to five. I'm working uh, under uh, General Cooley, who's leading this. And there's some other colleagues that we have, Jim Hurst, uh, John Meyer, and Mark Casson. And there's the emails. Feel free to contact us. And that's the layout uh, as it shows in a governance or a organizational kind of uh, picture. And I think that might be it, Pat. Yeah, thank, thank you, Chris. I, I think that's a, a terrific overview, and it seems like there's a lot of similarities between uh, what Nick is doing, you know, creating interoperability throughout the state, and what you're doing, creating standards, not only from base to base, but maybe even between uh, 
Army, Navy, Air Force, and the Marines. Um, Cheyenne, um, you know, I'd like to circle back to you to kind of, you know, review the, the challenges and opportunities that we do have in autonomy. You know, Nick talked about, let's say, more on the hardware side of, you know, a, a autonomous vehicle. And uh, we've talked about autonomy within software as we become more of a software centric society. Um, but I'd like for you to kind of address some of those challenges and opportunities. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, so I've been looking at the work on uh, CICD mm, uh, and continuous assurance uh, for autonomous systems. I see there are like four challenges, and some of these are technical challenges, and others are more organizational challenges. I'll start with the technical because uh, that's the area I have some expertise in. Uh, so one of the challenges for getting continuous integration and continuous assurance. So maybe I should pause here to define continuous assurance. This is the idea that also came up in the previous presentation that you make a change in your system and automatically that triggers the testing, integration, building, and generates results showing that, oh, this test worked, uh, this change worked, everything still works fine or it produces a counter counterexample or a bug report saying the change that you made right now in your software or design broke something right so this is this is what i mean by continuous assurance and it's happening all the time as you're developing your system design or code okay so one of the challenges is actually an obvious one it's just performance getting these tests to work quickly like i mentioned earlier like for the facebook code base it's 15 minutes it that's that's how long it takes to run a particular test that's a very impressive number so if you're designing an autonomous car uh, i think we need serious technical advances to say that small changes in the code for the car can be tested against simulations or whatever corner cases that you want to check in 15 minutes right so that's a serious performance uh, uh, challenge we have and technology is advancing, testing technology, verification technology, but we are not quite there yet. Um, and then only if we, it becomes really fast, uh, then we can do this continuous testing where uh, we are able to do these tests all the time with reasonable compute resources. The second uh, technical challenge is actually some, some kinds of testing is just fundamentally difficult to automate. Uh, so for example, if you want to really test your vehicle in an outdoor environment with realistic sensor data or with realistic human machine interactions, uh, that's something uh, which is hard to automate or sandbox in a simulation setting. And so we have to figure out ways to create more and more realistic models perhaps or log enough data to be able to do that systematically. And the last piece is requirements. Uh, there is a lot of progress on creating requirements, at least in particular application domains, but uh, specifically for autonomous systems where you have machine learning and data-driven uh, synthesis involved, uh, coming up with the right requirements is still an open problem. Um, yeah, let me stop here and you can read the bullets, remaining bullets uh, on that slide, which talks about this need for industry, government, university partnership. This is precisely what we are doing today here to create these open uh, frameworks, challenge problems so that different stakeholders can contribute in different ways uh, to addressing these challenges. Uh, Patrick, I think you're muted. Yeah, I think those challenges go across many agencies and uh, 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 industry partners. Um, I'd like to uh, maybe stop there as well and maybe open the floor for any questions of our of our panelists. Um, you can either use the chat window or um, 
take yourself off mute and ask the question. So one of the questions I have is really for Chris. Um, do you feel like um, this digital campaign is just another fad like, you know, maybe lean or Six Sigma or total quality management? Um, or do you feel like since we have general bunches buy in that um, this is something here to stay? Well, no, I think it's definitely something here to say. I like to uh, uh, comment on Cyan's um, last um, uh, part that he spoke about and, and, and completely agree with him. And, and I think he, he's spot on in, in his comments. And one of the areas that we are working on with, with various projects is how do you get to that 15 minutes? Because, uh, I mean, I don't know. I mean, 15 minutes is wonderful. I mean, it's, it's, that's just, you know, that's mind boggling. But I mean, you know, you know, how do you get to, you know, significant changes in like an autonomous algorithm where you have the assurance, for example, that he mentioned. Uh, and of course, it, it depends on the change of the, uh, the algorithm, right? Or a new hardware that you're going to inject, a new sensor that's going to be part of your algorithm. Whatever we could go on in many, many different instances on on what goes into the autonomy because autonomy itself, right, is a spectrum uh, of what it means. Uh, but in general, I, I totally agree with him. Appreciate hearing his comments. And one of the areas that, and I, and I think this relates to his comment, which at least is what it made me think about, is as we we believe as we go to standards and and these reference architectures that I mentioned. That indeed is going to constrain development, but we believe it's going to, we're very convinced, right? It's gonna constrain development in a very positive way. And the way that uh, I look at this simplistically uh, is with the, I'm using my Android phone right now, or you could pick the iPhone. And I know these are simple examples, uh, but get frequently used. And I think they're very good examples because whatever you're involved in, um, you have to have interfaces, and we call them right, in the software world, APIs, right? Application Program Interface. And that constrains, right? I mean, that constrains what you can do, but it constrains in a very good way. And the, the what I think we've seen from the uh, digital revolution is that by establishing the right standards, and what I want to say is even extending those to reference architectures, which I'd have to really get into, and I apologize, I can't get the fullest, ex or even close to the fullest extent of what I want to tell you here on, on reference architectures, but that will indeed be the mechanism, I believe, that will allow us to make these um, changes in autonomous algorithms and then uh, uh, with assurance, right? And then uh, use them in a digital ecosystem that I described to see the effect. And so you can uh, play that out with multiple players in multiple scenarios and with all the constraints and that has to be well orchestrated. And that's the, that's the struggle that, that we're going with now that we're facing now is, is establishing those me those mechanisms that that constrain and trying to get you know everybody on the same sheet of music. So it's definitely not a fad, and I, I tried to address that uh, uh, um, with my comment that General Bunch just told me right uh, a few minutes ago uh, when he was at AFA, and everybody and his his comment was you know Chris hey uh, when Dr. Roper left he said I had. I had, I don't know how many companies he said came up to him. He didn't know. He couldn't even remember how many companies came up to him and said, hey, is this just a passing thing now that Dr. Roper's gone? And he, he working with Ms. Costello right now up there in the, in the front office with the, um, General uh, Duke Richardson, he told them, no, this is absolutely the way, the only way that we know to get capability to the field faster. We've tried every other way. Uh, we are struggling mightily when you look at development times for any platform over the past 30 years, much less current platforms like the, the B21. It, you know, these are just acceptable. And then when we move into economy, right, which we, we're absolutely there, right? I mean, we've been, we've been working this for a while. We have to do much better. And so that digital ecosystem is I just briefed to the large material command, senior, all the senior leaders, right? Um, is the process that we're going to uh, follow. And again, I think it fits very well with the two briefers, the other briefers today and, and, and the subjects uh, that we, we talked about over. Yeah, very good. How do you um, envision like the all these different software companies and um, 
industry players, um, this confluence of autonomy coming together, whether it's the software and from dif disparate sources, how do we make sure that um, that all adheres to the same standards? Well, I think, I mean, there's several ways, right? I mean, uh, in no particular order. Um, one of them is establishing, and by the way, the Air Force is doing this with DARPA right now. Uh, we are developing in autonomous systems, and I can't go into the details, but we are establishing software development kits, right? I mean, right. had them for, SDKs. forever. SDKs, yeah. SDKs and for autonomy. And, and okay. so uh, doing this today, a very real, uh, we're, we're flying, uh, it's working. And so as you establish APIs, uh, as, as I'm saying, you establish open architecture standards. And for, for the Air Force, uh, which is obviously niched uh, in regards to the weapon systems we develop with avionics like radar, like EW, like data links, like EOIR sensors and so forth, things that information right that the that the autonomy is going to want the autonomy algorithm and again without getting into all the details in the spectrum of what autonomy means um just providing a reference that again a sensor developer can now go in and, and understand clearly how he fits into this autonomous system a, a, a an algorithm developer can know how he fits into it and again as Ian was talking about so well the assurance part of this, which by the way, we are working uh, with companies, right, to make sure that assurance is baked in from the beginning and in the CI CD pipeline or the development process, however you look at it, it's checked. So I hope that helps. Gotcha. Yeah, definitely. And Nick, would you say that's the same thing from the state's perspective and US DOT? Yeah, I would say definitely everything ba is based off of solid system engineering solid foundations, and then moving moving and in, in increasing those uh, message and data flows and those diagrams over time to adapt with technology. And, and would you say that the government is more the driving force for establishing those um, uh, standards or uh, making those decision pathways, or is it more of the um, suppliers or industry leaders who are developing that that software how or is it a balance of the two i don't know from um i think probably it's a it's a a leading balance or a leading leading percentage by the industry but i think without adoption from the government and assistance from the government you know industry can only 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 can handle what industry knows and as far as operations of transportation network and government sector operations. Um, definitely have to make sure that our input is there. Otherwise, things may get overlooked and, and assumptions may be made. Gotcha. So I think there's there's somewhat of a balance. And Cheyenne, are you seeing that from a research perspective of like when you have these innovations coming out? Um, and people are developing, let's say, new software code. How does that conform to, let's say, existing standards that are out there? Uh, in uh, pure software, I think the APIs and the SDKs and adherence to standard interfaces, it's sort of uh, well accepted and well understood, even in the research community. That's the way to go. Uh, with autonomy and cyber physical systems, I find that it's a little bit more challenging because ultimately you are trying to reason about open systems. Uh, the software is part of it, which has to then sit in the hardware and connect to the network and you know interact with people to complete the description of the system. And um, simulators can play a role there. Hardware in the loop uh, kind of uh, setups can help, but um, there the interfaces are not as cleanly defined or even if, um, they are uh, they are pr proprietary, so some companies may not be willing to part with their hardware specifications as easily as sharing some software library. So that is indeed uh, one of the speed bumps that we have to uh, go over. Oh, very good, thank you. And maybe one last parting question, maybe for Chris, since we have a lot of uh, the Dayton Wright Patterson um, 
um, contingent here on on the line. How would you define success for the um, digital campaign? Uh, that's a well. That's a that's a that's a really good question. I think that um, there's probably a lot of different aspects of the campaign. Uh, you know, to make us uh, successful, we have the 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 five lines of effort, as I said. And you, you want ultimate success? I mean, you want me to project uh, five or ten years into the future? Because or even of- individual, how you're measuring success along the line? Right. So. Wow, I mean that. I mean, I just give you, give you my thoughts that, that um, uh, attack this idea of success, which we thought about in multiple ways. So, so one of them is, you know, as I mentioned, if you look at a very complex weapon system, you're looking at typically, I don't know, 12 years, right, for development. Yeah. From, and you and that and that's real sloppy because you're like, where do you start and where are you ending? What are you calling it? And it's like, all right, well, we can call it a lot of different start stops, but roughly 12 years. So, so success to me would be in the future in, in, in 20 years or more is that we're developing complex weapon systems in half that time, six or six or seven years. That would be success that I can mm-hmm. use this digital ecosystem. But see, that's when I say that, that's a guiding light for me personally and what I'm doing and, and trying to pass on to people after me, uh, because I think we need that long, long vision of, of what success. Uh, so I so I'm trying to bookend it for you. What's that? Yeah. You know, in 20 years, I want to develop systems in six years. Right. Uh, what's the near term? I, I want to train people. I mean, what's success for me in the near term? Success for me in the near term is getting a, a, a good amount of money to start sending my engineers to uh, SysML development classes. Uh, I want I'm trying to build. So that would be number one. In the near term, number one for me right now, success is I need to start training engineers. Um and, and, and there's so many aspects. I, I don't have enough software engineers. Uh, I don't have enough computer scientists. I mean, I'm working on that today, right? We're trying to figure out in this new world, and we've known this for, for several years. I've actually known this, been working on it. Um, so we need to hire more software engineers. Um, and, and the Air Force is constrained by uh, his, historically by how we want people to be credentialed. Uh, we're not like business. Uh, and I, and I, again, a whole big long rabbit trail of hiring practices and the qualifications that you look for. And the Air Force has a very rigid requirements approach, which I think is, and many people think, I'm not on my own on this, right, are way outdated. It's it's way past time. It's archaic, and it's not getting good talent because the Air Force system hasn't been changed to get uh, the the 19, 20, 22 25 year old who might have a history degree and he's a great programmer. Um, and and we're, we're missing many, many opportunities. So I want to yeah. train, I want to hire. That's what I'm trying to do now as we have all kind of little MVP projects going on with assurance, with trying to, and I, and I agree again with Shine's comments that um, what I was trying to address on that was once we do get this uh, reference architecture and this ecosystem in place, how now do I get innovation anywhere? And so, um, yes, indeed, we have a lot to do to put this ecosystem in place and to put the many things in this court, in case we're talking about here, you know, autonomy, to put those aspects of um, autonomy in, uh, as the case is, right, so that we can indeed now go fast. So it's definitely not easy. I'm not, I'm not trying to say it's easy. There is a lot uh, to do, but if we can just get at it, I'm convinced we can do it. If we will, uh, you know, from the Air Force point of view, if we will start investing. And I've seen, again, in some classified programs, some really good work going on, but they're very stovepiped. Uh, and I need to figure out myself how to proliferate what's being learned in, in very stovepiped uh, programs out across the board to get to this enterprise that I'm trying to work on. Over. Great. Yeah, and really focus on acceleration, it seems like, accelerating the workforce. Uh, development, accelerating, um, you know, the the software code and such. So I think um, I think we'll leave it there for today. I think uh, really appreciate everyone joining us today. Again, um, this presentation was uh, recorded and uh, we'll be uploading that as well as the presentation that each of our panelists uh, provided. 
and uh, really thank everyone for joining us today. Have a great evening. Thank you very much for moderating. Yeah, thanks, Pat. Uh, thank you. Thanks, everyone.